So hi, I'm Vijay Balasubramanian, and I'm a theoretical physicist. And I think about this thing up there, it's your brain, the thing inside your head. And I'm interested in trying to understand the rules and principles, laws, if you will, that govern how the circuits inside your head let you live, love, learn, and understand TED Talks. Now, um, that's a big topic. And to illustrate the kind of approach I take, I think it's useful to have an example, so we're going to talk about a small example. And the example we're going to discuss is how your brain maintains your sense of place, how you know where you are in an environment. Now, the brain, at its fundamentals, is made of neurons. And neurons are cells like any other cell in your body, but they're special cells. At the top, in this picture behind me, you see these wires coming in, the dendrites. Those are the input wires of a neuron that allow it to take in information from other things, like the environment or other neurons and bring it into the neuron. The neuron then does something, figures out if it's interesting, and then sends messages out through an output wire, which is the long wire coming down from the neuron. That's the axon, and that sends messages elsewhere. Now, what sorts of messages are these? Well, neurons are electrical circuit elements, just like transistors and diodes and what have you in silicon circuits. So neurons, their body, the cell body, is normally at a voltage of about, let's say, minus 70 millivolts. And then, if the neuron finds something interesting in its input, it goes boom and makes a very rapid voltage spike. They're called action potentials in the trade. And anyway, you make this little voltage spike and it goes zoop down the axon and sends messages to other places. So all of your thoughts are really electrical signals like they would be in a computer. But of course, a single neuron can't appreciate poetry, can't love somebody else, and so all of that must come from more. And indeed, neurons are gathered together into circuits and networks of a very big size in the brain. So behind me, there's a very famous and very beautiful picture of the retina which is a piece of your brain stuck at the back of your eye that converts photons into particles of light into electrical signals for processing in the brain. Now, this picture that Ramoni Cajal, the founder of neuroscience, drew about 100 years ago shows many, many kinds of neurons connected together in some very complex network, just as if you were to look at a microchip, you would find many kinds of circuit elements connected together in a complicated circuit. So, fine, so there are circuits of this kind. But of course, this is a specific circuit. It does one thing. It takes light and makes electrical signals. And if you think about the whole variety of thoughts that you have, there must be more still, and indeed there is. So this is the whole brain. The whole brain has different kinds of circuits and networks embedded all over it that do all the different things that we do. So for example, right here on the back of your head, there's the visual cortex that has the circuits that allow you to see and process visual images. In the front over here, in your prefrontal cortex, there are the circuits that help form your personality and help you with things like planning and decisions and things of this nature. Today, we're interested in your sense of place, how you know where you are. And the circuits that help you know where you are are stored in the middle of the brain, sort of in the middle, can't draw it so easily in the picture there, and in two areas of the brain called the hippocampus, and the entorhinal cortex. Uh, we're mostly going to talk about the entorhinal cortex. Great, so that's your introduction to neuroscience. Now, I've been talking about your sense of place. Now, what do we mean by that? We should start by discussing what you mean by your sense of space, of location. Uh, so here's a location, a place that I'm familiar with. This is my living room. And I know it very well. When I'm in it, I know I'm there. I can close my eyes, and I can walk about and basically not bump into stuff. Somehow, somewhere inside my head, here, that place is stored, and we'd like to know how. Now, how is here stored? Well, I already told you that everything in the brain is made of neurons firing electrical signals. So somehow, this place must be an abstract pattern of neural firing inside your head, and somehow, that abstract pattern of neural firing must maintain a map of your location. In the trade, that map is called the cognitive map, and people have been wanting for a long time to understand this. Now, about 12 years ago, 
a very important clue developed in our understanding of this cognitive map. So there was a lab in Norway of uh, Edvard Maybrit Moser, and they had rats running around some enclosure, and they had implanted electrodes to record from a piece of the brain the entorhinal cortex, which has been misspelled there, uh, <laughs> the entorhinal cortex, and, um, the, um, and what did they find? Well, they would record from a neuron, and they would find that the neuron would fire when the rat was in specific locations in this room. So it'd go brr, stop, brr, stop, as the rat walked around. So they kept a, they, they, they collated all this firing. And up top, in the topmost picture, you see a hot spots of where this neuron fired, or where the rat was when this neuron fired. And what do you see? You see that this particular neuron fired when the rat was in this enigmatic grid of locations in the, uh, inside the room. Even more surprisingly, or interestingly, as they poked deeper into the entorhinal cortex with their electrode, they found other neurons that fired on bigger grids, and then on bigger grids still. So there were these lattices in the world uh, um, which, at which these neurons fired. So here's the question. Oh, what's more, even more interestingly, by the way, if you took the rat away, right, and brought it back the next day, this kind of map, if you like, of the world, these kind of grids embedded on the world, uh, were uploaded, were reloaded into the rat's brain instantaneously. So it really felt like this is some kind of map of the world. But the question is, how? Right? What do these patterns mean? Right? How did they maintain a map of the world? Now, I'm a theoretical physicist. And my job in life is to dream up explanations for interesting things that happen in the world. That's what I like to do for a living. That's what I do for a living. Now, that's a trade, that's a job that requires two important traits. One is imagination, because you need to dream up new explanations for things. And it needs courage, because you can often be wrong. Okay? But nevertheless, let's try. Let's try to imagine an interpretation of these experimental findings. OK, so I'm going to follow the method that physicists usually follow, which is to first simplify the problem. Right? I'm going to imagine that we live in a one-dimensional world, just a line, you know? We live on a line, and that the whole world is eight meters long, and that for whatever reason, we need to know where we are with a resolution, a precision of one meter. So I want to imagine how I would devise a neural system to tell me where I am with that precision. Well, easy, right? I'll break up the world into eight blocks, like so, up there, and then I'll assign one neuron to fire in each of those eight blocks. So as you move around, if you're neuron number three, you fire when the rat is in block number three, that kind of thing. Well, clearly, that's a map of the world, right? It's a kind of representation of where you are, and it requires eight neurons. So here's another way. What you could do is you could take the whole room and divide it into two halves. I've colored, that's the top line over there. And I've colored the left half blue and the right half orange. And we get the blue neuron to fire when you're in the left half of the room and the orange neuron to fire when you're in the right half of the room. Then you divide the room into quarters, OK? And now I again assign two neurons, one to fire along the second line there one to fire in the left half of the left half of the room, and the left half of the right half of the room, and, the or and another neuron, the orange one, to fire in the right half of the left half of the room, and the right half of the right half. You get the picture. You subdivide by twos, OK? Now, suppose I was going to call these neurons the zero neuron and the one neuron, based upon left versus right. Then the first location, the one on this side, would be labeled zero, one, zero. And the second location, marked in the second dashed line, would be labeled 101. Clearly, this is also a way of maintaining a map of the world. If you were a computer scientist, you'd probably do it this way. And this would be what's called a binary code for the world. You know, binary because it's zeros and ones, and you're using binary codes to number out all the locations. If you wanted, you could use divide into tens and make a decimal code. OK? So these are the ways we can imagine writing out your location in one dimension. 
So let's apply this experience to thinking about how you would map out your location in two dimensions, because that's what we seem to do. That's what the rats seem to do as they walk around the world. So here we go. Imagine, again, in a simplified way, that the world is an 8 meter by 8 meter box, and that I need to know where I am with a precision, a resolution of 1 meter by 1 meter. That's what I need for my behavior. How could I do this? Well, following what we imagined before, I could break up the whole world into 64 little boxes that are 1 meter by 1 meter, assign one neuron to fire in each of these little boxes, and I would have a map of the world. It would cost you 64 neurons, but you could definitely do this. So that's one thing we could imagine. Here's another thing we could imagine. I'll start by breaking up the world into four corners, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, all colored differently here. Then I'll take, let's say, the northwest corner and break it up into quarters. Then take each of those pieces and break it up into quarters. This is just like what I did before, if it was a one-dimensional world. Right? And then, if I wanted to tell you where the cross is in that picture, I would say it's in the blue, yellow, blue. Right? That's a way of telling you where you are. So that is one way of producing another kind of map of the world. And of course, you could subdivide into tens like decimal systems and all these kinds of things. But this is a way of describing where you are. So I would now like to draw an analogy. Look at these pictures. On the left side, we have the experimental data. On the right side is the thing we just imagined as a way of describing position. Don't they look similar? First, at one end, you have big grids. Then you have smaller grids. Then you have smallest grids. And in some way, you can put this information potentially together. So if you believe the analogy, we would say that somehow the brain, the entorhinal cortex, has developed a sort of two-dimensional, fuzzy sort of number system for numbering out locations in the world. That would be the interpretation you would place on this. So that's a theorist talking. How can you build evidence for this? Right, to build evidence for a theory, you need to make a prediction that you can test. So let's go for that. So how do you build such a prediction? Well, if this is like a number system, I could ask, should the brain build a binary number system? Should it build a decimal number system? What should it do? And in this neural context, whether it's binary or decimal, really, what that's really talking about is you see how these grids get bigger and bigger and bigger? Well, you can take the ratio of the size of one grid divided by the size of the next smaller grid, you know, telling you how it scales up. And that's really telling you what kind of number system you would have. So if it scales up by factors of two, it's like binary. If it like like, scales up like factors of 10, then it's like decimal. So we could try to predict this. Right? If you really believe our theory of the brain that we're building here, we should be able to predict what sort of number system the brain should use to represent location in a two-dimensional world. For that, you need a principle. What principle can you use? Well, so here's the idea. So I'm saying the brain should have a certain kind of two-dimensional number system to describe the world. Well, here's a principle that neural circuits should be organized to consume resources efficiently. Why am I saying this? Well, the brain, you know, on the one hand, is extremely efficient. It consumes about 12 to 20 watts of power, whereas your laptop consumes about 80 watts of power, and, you know, your, your laptop doesn't write poetry. Right? So it's somehow extremely efficient. On the other hand, your brain is also extremely expensive. It's 2% of your body weight, but fully 20% of your metabolic load. Your brain costs you more than muscle when you're working out. So this has led neuroscientists to suppose that neural circuits should be efficient in their consumption of resources because they're already so expensive that there should be something in their organization that makes them efficient in using up you know, power and space and so on in the head. So we can hypothesize that the grid system that I told you about in the head is a number system, and that it should be organized to minimize the cost of representing where you are in the world. OK. So physicists, theorists like me, what do we do when we see a thing like this? We mathematize it. You know, we make it more abstract. So here's an abstract description of the grid. We put down some variables and some parameters, and we build a theory. We say, OK, the resolution, the precision of this abstract description of the world should be set by the behavior of the animal. 
we say that the cost of the grid, of the system, should grow with the number of neurons, because surely the more the neurons you need, the more expensive the whole thing is going to be. And that we'll agree that what we want to predict is how this thing scales up, the ratio of the sizes between these scales. Okay? And then a good theorist can write down a mathematical theory of this and ask which grid, which way of representing space, of location of the world, is the most efficient. So you can do that, and what we found is that a prediction. The prediction is that the way in which these grids will scale up as you poke into the entorhinal cortex is by ratios of the square root of a famous mathematical number called E. This E is Euler's number, a number that Euler, the famous mathematician, devised for other purposes. And what do you know? Experiments confirm this theory precisely. So what do we learn from this? Well, I think at the simplest level, we learn that nature seems to have, long before humans did, devised these kinds of complicated number systems and in a two-dimensional, fuzzy, neural kind of way, and then proceeded to optimize it for the neural hardware. I think that's the first lesson we learn. Somewhat more broadly, these results suggest that the brain is a sort of elegant and efficient mathematical machine, and that we can use this idea of elegance and efficiency of this engine in our head to build a theory of organization of the brain. Even more broadly, I think what I just told you has a bearing on a famous dictum of Galileo. So hundreds of years ago, Galileo wrote that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And you know, physicists, people like me, have especially taken that seriously. So over the decades, over centuries, there's a fully mathematical description of the world, and physicists believe you have explained a phenomenon if you have a precise mathematical description of it, and that makes predictions for the next experiment. I believe that this is the century where the living world will receive finally the same kind of treatment. For, you know, again, for centuries, we've described life and living things mostly descriptively. But I believe that in this century, the study of life will become as mathematical and beautiful as the study of atoms, crystals, and the forces of nature. Thank you.